Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear the opening sections of Hannah Greaser's book, The Clouds Ye So Much Dread, read by Hannah Greaser, forward by N.D. Wilson. Hannah Greaser, formerly Atwood, is one of those people whom I feel as if I have always known. There are a few of those folks around in this small town where we both grew up. In Hannah's case, I don't remember when I met her, but I know it was in elementary school. In 1996, we graduated from Logos School together in a class of only 17 students. Classes that size get to know each other pretty well. After college and graduate school, I worked under her father at New St. Andrews College. Later, I co-taught college freshmen alongside her husband. Rory, my eldest son, entered kindergarten with Jonah. Hannah's eldest. For years, our families lived one block apart on the same street, and I have many memories of our son's lively conversations in the back seat during carpool. I watched them together in school plays and spelling bees and speech meets, on baseball diamonds and basketball courts. As I write this, I am keeping one eye on the clock, knowing that I will soon jump in my truck and drive to watch the first basketball game of our boys' sophomore season. Many of the memories I have of our long cohabitation of this small town have gone murky, but one Saturday stands out perfectly clearly. Our sons were playing in a summer lacrosse league together, and the day was perfect. Flocks of brightly lit clouds were migrating through our vast Idaho sky above our small battling offspring. I was standing on the sideline with Hannah's husband, talking about nothing important. While it must have been warm, hot even, I only remember a cold and certain knowledge of wrongness creeping up inside me. Rory, always a mulish defender, was himself. But Jonah, normally quick and slippery on attack, a certainty to score, indefatigable, was not himself at all. He looked exhausted, beaten, even limp. I asked his father what was wrong. He told me that it might be mono. But I had seen mono before and Jonah's transformation struck me as far more extreme. Not too long after that Saturday, we heard the terrifying news. Jonah had been diagnosed with leukemia. And this leads me back to Hannah, back to my memories, and then to this book you hold in your hands. The Hannah I knew in school was smart, tough, artistic, dry, independent, unemotional, and competitive in a way that never showed her effort. I never would have used any adjectives connected to fear to describe her. She was never timid, never a complainer, never one to bemoan an obstacle. Imagine being a young girl and being pulled out of your very close class to go live in Kenya or Poland. But she never showed any sign of upheaval, no sign of nervousness beforehand. And upon her return, she shrugged off her adventurous exiles like they were nothing. She simply re-entered our class. She didn't show any worry about how much she had missed, about how much living her friends had done without her, or any new friends she had left behind. Hannah never showed any fearfulness at all during her school years, at least not to the boys. In adulthood, even as a mother to a son with leukemia, she also never wore her fear on the outside. It was there, she acknowledged it, but she never made it her brand, or even an accessory. Now that I have this book in my hands, I feel like I never knew her at all. Hannah writing about fear? Hannah struggling with fear? This journey she has gone on, this path she has walked, has changed her. How could it not? She is still an artist. She is still smart, dry, and independent but she is no longer trying to hide her effort. This is not a thing that could be shrugged off. What she faced, externally and internally, is now painted in this book, in print, for everyone to see. She has taken her trials and the trials of her family, and she has set out to distill their value for the sake of others. She may have bottled up her struggles, but those bottles are now meant to be exported and opened. Through all of this, she has distilled a vintage of God's grace that is lovely and encouraging potent and tender. On these pages, she offers comfort, companionship, and guidance for anyone facing any kind of fear, which is to say, for mortals, for all of us. And I, for one, am grateful. N.D. Wilson, December 2017. Preface. This book is not a theological treatise. This book is not a memoir. This book is not exactly a collection of essays, either. This book, I suppose, falls somewhere into the cracks in between. It's true that this book is about me, 
It's hard to avoid that when writing stories from my own life. But this is also a book about trials big and small, about cancer, about suffering, about death, and especially about the temptation to fear. Sounds like a real downer, I know. But let me assure you that while these frightful things are the reason for this book, none of them is the point of this book. The real point is God himself and the comfort that his fearful and afflicted children can find only by trusting him. However, while attempting to write the pages that follow, I didn't begin with a clear point in mind. I started by simply going through tidbits I'd already written, blog posts, journal entries, notes jotted on the backs of receipts, looking for ideas and recollections, or even turns of phrase that struck me as significant. At first, I rolled along down the well-worn ruts of memory lane, pausing at a familiar landmark here, enjoying a favorite view there. But eventually, I found myself steering toward old byways that I hadn't especially wanted to revisit, and turning over long-forgotten stones where I rediscovered some darker bits that I had hoped never to unearth. A lot of disparate memories surfaced, and none of them seemed to have anything other than me in common. This turns out to be a rather weak premise for a book. A few memories about cancer and world travel, plus some anecdotes about health fads, and a handful of miscellaneous thoughts on money and childbirth. No unifying principle. No theme. I couldn't even pitch that book idea to myself. However, I wanted to write and I had agreed to write, so write I did, praying that I could find a thread that would tie this whole scattered hodgepodge together. Then early this year, I was asked to join a small panel discussion at the local Christian college on the subject of feminine strength, which is not a subject to which I'd really given much thought. What does it mean to be a strong Christian woman? Later that week, as I was reading 1 Peter 3, 6, the description of Sarah jumped out at me. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So often the focus and the attendant controversy over submission centers on the first half of that verse while the second half gets lost in the skirmish. But as I read, it was the second half that stood out. You are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Do not fear anything that is frightening. This, of course, assumes that some things we face are frightening, including, one would think, being married to a man like Abraham. How massively would you have freaked out when word of that whole sacrifice of Isaac incident reached you, So the Apostle Peter holds up Sarah's fearlessness as something for us to aspire to. Hashtag goals, anyone? With the question of what is a strong Christian woman in mind, I realized that fearlessness is one of the chief traits of all the great women in Scripture. Sarah, following Abraham's call from God to pursue some seemingly crazy and dangerous endeavors, which required letting go of fear and instead trusting God's promises. Rahab, hiding enemy spies because she had heard and believed in the power of the God of Israel. Deborah, marching out with the armies of Israel and their weak-kneed commander against the iron chariots of Sisera. Jael, most blessed of women, inviting the enemy king into her tent to pound a stake through his skull. Ruth, leaving everything she had known to follow Naomi and Naomi's God into a land where Moabites like her were despised. Abigail, both undercutting the tyrannical folly of her husband and confronting an armed and angry future King David at the same time. Esther, taking her life in her hands to approach the king with the words, If I perish, I perish, on her lips. Mary. Jesus' mother, bravely and joyfully receiving the news of a pregnancy that could lead to public ridicule and to rejection by the man she planned to marry, and so many more. These women had courage. 
They had chutzpah. They had guts. But more fundamentally, they had faith. Faith in God. Faith in his promises. Faith in his goodness. Faith in his justice. Faith in his saving power. These women did not fear anything that is frightening. Fear would mean hearing God's promises and then calling him a liar. Fighting fear and learning to trust God is, for me, a constant struggle. But these women were strong because they fearlessly believed God, and we are Sarah's daughters if we do the same. As I meditated on this, it struck me that one of the themes that ran through everything I'd already been writing was the tug-of-war between fear and faith, between dread of life's storm clouds and trust in the one who holds us fast. The more I wrote, the more clear it became that, regardless of the incident I was recalling, my fears and God's faithfulness were the common threads that tie these pages together and form the heart of this book. So this book is, in one sense, an autobiography. I tell it in the first person simply because I lived it in the first person. Plenty of memoirs and biographies out there can inspire or horrify you with their tales of unparalleled tragedy and triumph. This is not that book. My life really hasn't been anything very exceptional. My goal is not, primarily, to tell you who I am. Rather, through stories of common, run-of-the-mill fears, fears like yours and mine, my goal is to show you, in some small way, who God is. He is extraordinary. He is faithful. We can trust him with our very lives, so we need not be afraid of anything that is frightening. Chapter 1 A Spirit Not of Fear Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24 Age 22 was, if not the best of times, at least the most optimistic. My college diploma had scarcely begun to collect dust. My job as a graphic designer at a magazine was filling my nine-to-fives, and then some, with just the kind of duties I had planned toward for four years, and I had recently celebrated my first wedding anniversary to a handsome, hard-working man who was beginning his senior year of college and already sending out job applications in anticipation of a career as a teacher. My husband, Jason, and I lived on a quiet street in a sunny little basement apartment filled with shiny new wedding gifts. We enjoyed a lovely little circle of friends. We attended a thriving church. We watched our modest savings grow little by little each month. We even had a retirement account, for pity's sake. And looking ahead, I envisioned an unbroken succession of picture-perfect years, stretching before us like a lush expanse of suburban lawn. At 22, my life and the life I imagined were as sweet, as simple, and in some respects as substantial as a cloud of cotton candy. Then one day in September, I learned that I was pregnant, and suddenly my spun sugar prospects seemed to dissolve. This pregnancy had not been unexpected. We had planned for this. We had prayed for this. We had wanted this. And although I'd been apprehensive, I assumed that when the day came, I'd be ready to face it with courage, dignity, and grace. But when the reality of the news finally sank in, I stared into the bathroom mirror, gripped the edge of the counter, and could feel only one sensation. Terror. As soon as those two little lines showed up on the pregnancy test, fear came knocking and I foolishly flung wide the doors of my heart and invited her in. I'd met her before on many occasions, and she had sometimes visited for a day or two, maybe even for a couple of weeks, as an uninvited guest before I sent her packing. But this time, fear had arrived with a moving van and had quickly filled and redecorated every corner with her collection of sharp objects and heavy furnishings, 
In the process, she had unceremoniously torn down most of the light fixtures, shuttered the windows, tossed my faithful friend Joy onto the curb with the trash, and settled in for an extended stay. Long before Fear's official move-in date, I'd already anticipated the huge adjustments that would be in store for me as a mother. Before the arrival of my first child, I had struggled at times with worries about almost everything to do with motherhood. The nursing, the diaper changing, the lack of sleep, the social adjustments, the decisions about education, the discipline, and so on. I had invested very little of my imaginative resources on the joys of motherhood and the blessings children could bring. I don't remember playing much with baby dolls as a child. I played doctor. I played store proprietor. I played orphan. I played Lego architect. But I don't remember my childhood aspirations inclining toward playing the role of mommy. As I got older, Young children often struck me as more of a bother than a blessing. And as a high schooler, after a particularly horrid babysitting episode, I had gone so far as to announce that I never wanted to have children. At the time, I absolutely meant it. Later, when I started college, I remember taking one of those personality tests to help determine a course of studies best suited to my natural gifts. And do you know what career type I scored lowest on? Caregiver. My natural gifts were apparently least suited toward taking care of the weak and the helpless. And if that's not a perfect description of what a young mother, and let's be honest, every Christian must do, I don't know what is. This is one of the reasons I bristle a bit when Christians talk about our callings as if they were nothing more than the career choices that correspond with our natural talents and desires. In order for someone to be called, someone else must be doing the calling. And that someone calls us to love our crooked neighbors and to bless those who hate us and to lay our lives down, regardless of whether we would be more naturally inclined to do precisely the opposite. In fact, None of us is naturally gifted at these things. We must be supernaturally gifted. When we are called, it is sometimes to do the very things that most clearly expose to us how inadequate we are in our own strength and how much we need the Spirit of Christ to fill and equip us to do the hard things that He requires of us. For me, one of those hard things was learning to be a mother. This new role was going to be the biggest stretch, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, of any I'd yet experienced. I was in for a challenge, that much I knew. I had no delusions about what creature comforts, what social connections, and what career opportunities I'd likely be setting aside when I became a mother, and it frightened me. I was, in short, afraid to lose my life as I had known it. But even these concerns paled in comparison to my fear of just one solitary thing, giving birth. I was aware that this wasn't an entirely rational fear. I knew that while childbirth throughout much of the world and through most of history was fraught with deadly dangers, childbirth in a 21st century American hospital was overwhelmingly likely to result in both a healthy mother and child. My own mother had experienced two very uneventful pregnancies and two healthy births. So had most of my aunts and cousins. We come from good breeding stock, as one of my aunts once put it. So it wasn't that I believed I was destined for a tragic birth story. If pressed, I could have rattled off any number of reasons to look forward to a safe, uncomplicated birth experience. But as my due date drew nearer, I just couldn't shake the sense of impending doom. My husband and I dutifully attended a childbirth class at the local hospital, filling out our worksheets, reading the recommended books, and raising our hands to answer questions. If I had been asked to take a quiz about the step-by-step progression of labor and delivery, I don't doubt that I could have aced it. I studied so much I could probably have written a textbook-ready essay 
with scientific accuracy on the distinct stages of childbirth and the various comfort measures that would ease the process. I was 100% academically ready to give birth. However, when it came to facing the real-life challenge I'd so diligently studied, head knowledge seemed worse than useless. The more I learned about what was coming, the more I feared it. I had been around plenty of sweet, joyful young mothers, but even that turned out to be less than encouraging since it was some of those same ladies who had unwittingly helped to plant the seeds of fear in the rich soil of my imagination in the first place. What is it about proximity to infants that gives women an almost irresistible desire to share the worst possible birth stories in a sort of sick parlor game of one-upmanship? Oh yeah, that's pretty awful, but let me tell you about the time my sister hemorrhaged so badly she almost died. Over the years, I had listened at baby showers to so many older women share tales of horrifying blood and guts exploits in the delivery room that my mental picture of childbirth had gradually come to resemble the opening scenes from Saving Private Ryan. One evening, about halfway through my pregnancy, When our birth class gathered to watch a video depicting several different women in the throes of labor, I very nearly fainted. And I am not one who faints. I can laugh about it now, but I literally had to close my eyes, drop my head toward my knees, and take deep breaths to keep from passing out during that video. Filled as it was with moaning women, shouts of pain, and infants covered in blood and slime, It was ghastly. I could not tell whether the spasms I was feeling in my belly were my baby's active movements or a case of nervous butterflies. No, not butterflies. Bats. Bats on crack. When the fluorescent lights flicked back on at the end of this informative little film, Jason glanced at my face and then widened his eyes with faint alarm. You okay? He whispered in my ear. Nope, I whispered back. He later told me that he'd never seen my face so ghostly white. I'm sure I had never felt so frail and afraid. Nor had I ever felt my fear lead so immediately to resentment. I started to feel bitter on behalf of all the nameless heroines whose flesh had torn and whose lives had ended in order to bring forth the men whose names would go down in history for having escaped battle without so much as a paper cut. Hail, mighty men of valor. Meanwhile, the ladies, if they are mentioned at all, seem to get the historical equivalent of a participation ribbon. Was that fair? Was that right? I wasn't just terrified. I was angry and terrified. My fear at root was a spiritual problem that was all tied up with selfishness and a growing bitterness toward God for my lot in life as a woman. This kind of fear was built on an unacknowledged distrust of God's handling of my story, of all the stories. Rather than standing in awe of him, I was attempting to stand in judgment over him, whose very breath I borrowed to voice my complaints. Rather than letting my thoughts and feelings about motherhood begin with the fear of God, they began with a fear of just about everything else. Fear became the warped glass through which I peered out at the world, distorting whatever I saw or heard or felt. My head could assent to the neatly packaged theological proposition that children are a blessing and that God's promises are true. My head could assent to the neatly packaged theological proposition that children are a blessing and that God's promises are true. My heart, however, was a roiling black cauldron of bitterness and terror. In the grip of these bouts of dread, my throat would tighten and I could hear the whoosh, whoosh of my own racing pulse in my ears. I could hardly speak. And speechlessness usually means prayerlessness. So long as I could bury the thought of labor and delivery underneath other distractions, 
I was able to function almost normally. I kept busy to keep my mind on other things. But as the prospect of birth came more frequently to mind, fear's chokehold kept me from speaking about it to anybody, least of all to my God. The sacrifice is so worth it, smiling women had assured me. But now, as my belly grew, my confidence in this assertion had shriveled. The sacrifice part, I could still understand. It was, in fact, the only part I seemed to understand. It was the worth it part that was so hard to believe. Honestly, the memory of this internal turmoil is something I'd rather keep to myself. These memories pain me, and to write about them, to expose them to public scrutiny, is genuinely mortifying. But what I hope to do is not to revel in the fear and brokenness so that we can all commiserate and make peace with the mess, but to dig out the root of that selfish fear and to kill it right where it grows. None of us should be in the least bit surprised that female fertility is at the center of some of our fiercest cultural battles. It is also at the center of many women's fiercest internal and spiritual battles. The ability to bear children is simultaneously an awesome strength and an awful vulnerability, an unparalleled superpower that can bring us to our knees. Pregnancy and motherhood can present more temptations to fear and despair than I can name, so it seems unlikely that I could have been the only happily married, middle-class, conservative Christian woman who has given way to fear and dread over the thought of giving birth to a child. And sadly, given the decades-long bloodbath that we have witnessed since Roe vs. Wade, across the whole economic, ethnic, marital, and yes, even religious spectrum of our society, it is also very, very likely that at least a few of these women have let that fear lead them to the knife. Fear, in fact, appears to be the abortion industry's most powerful selling point, which is one of the reasons I felt compelled to bring this ugly chapter of my experience to light. To a woman who is pregnant and scared, care no matter what, Planned Parenthood's slogan, is what she most wants. But fear can drive her to look for it in the worst of places. The voices from the abortion industry are masters at giving fear a megaphone and turning up the volume until it drowns out everything else. What will happen to your friendships, your reputation, your education, your body image, your love life, your money, your career? It will all fall into ruins unless you allow us to cut away the source of those fears. These champions of choice, adept at convincing pregnant young women that there is no choice, offer only one way to end the fear, bloodshed. But when fear leads to bloodshed, bloodshed also leads to guilt, something that cannot be crushed and extracted with surgical instruments. And the guilt, as many post-abortive women have discovered, gives birth to new and weightier fears that rush in to take the place of the old. Who, dear lady, will care for you, no matter what, now? There is no government-subsidized clinic, no pink-hat street rally, no fundraiser fun run to assist you. I'm grateful that, even on my worst days, the abortion solution was never one I considered though my fear and lack of faith were the same root sins of those who have. I refused to believe in the promises offered by my right to choose. But despite the lip service I gave to God's kindness and sovereignty, I was refusing to rest in his promises. I felt that I had already surrendered quite enough of my own painless, predictable plans to his. Thank you very much. So why was he demanding this, too? Couldn't this quiet life, this painless existence, this familiar, comfortable body be mine and mine alone? God was meddling with something that I desperately wanted to control. My body, my choice. Sound familiar? This kind of fear is clearly not unique to me. 
And it's true that we do need a solution to it. We need our fear and guilt and shame to be washed away. It's also true that the only thing that can finally wash it away is the blood of an innocent victim. The abortion peddlers got at least that part of the story right. The question then is not whether innocent blood is necessary, but whose. Unlike those who are offering the other solution, Christians do not hide the bloodiness of their answer behind clinical language or pink signs or tidy code words. How could we? The blood of Christ is not a political platform. It is our life. It is not pink. It is red as wine. Only when we find forgiveness in him and lay the weight of our faithless fears at his feet do we finally find the perfect care we are seeking. Care no matter what. Only his yoke is easy. Only his burden is light. Why, I wonder, is it so easy to forget how great God's kindness is toward his children? For us who know him, It's almost always a failure of memory that has led to a failure of nerve. God has warned us so many times not to forget him, not to forget his words, not to forget his works. And yet we do it all the time. We should never kid ourselves into thinking that we're really all that different from the people of Israel panicking on the very brink of the beauty and abundance of the promised land. Like them, We know the mighty works of God, that he can create the universe with a word and reduce empires to ashes with a breath. But when we see that there are giants in the land, suddenly we forget everything we've witnessed and we sound the retreat and try to run away from the very blessings he has offered through faith to give us. At least that's what I did. There I was, pregnant, on the very border of this great blessing and I was telling myself that childbirth was too big an obstacle for the God who rules the nations and raises the dead. I wish I could say that on one momentous day before Jonah, my first child, was born. I suddenly came to my senses and turned my fears over to God, but I didn't. I was afraid right up until the day I went into labor. The labor itself was long, but nothing terrible. And after I had been carried safely through, I should have been swept away by gratitude and relief. But given how poorly I'd prepared to receive the joy set before me, I remained miserable for weeks. It took many hours of intense prayer, lots of psalm reading, countless hard-fought battles against self-pity, and constant words of encouragement from my husband, as well as quiet moments of simply recognizing to my astonishment, the image of God in my son, before the fear and bitterness started to wane. It took sheer divine mercy before I began to embrace cheerfully the incredible gift that I, blinded by my own self-centeredness, had so begrudgingly received. It was my husband who first noticed that a change was underway. One day when Jonah was still only a few months old, He contracted an illness that made it impossible for him to keep down any fluids. He was feverish and almost too sick to cry. So I held him in my arms and cried for him. Not for me. Not for all the extra laundry he was making. Not for my wasted efforts at feeding him. Not for worries over how we'd pay the doctor bill if it came to that. No, I broke down in tears because I loved my son and hated to see him suffer. When Jason saw my tears and I told him what was wrong, he pointed out to me the significance of this change. It had happened so gradually that I'd missed it. I loved my son. Not myself through him, but him, himself. And somehow, along the way, my fear and resentment over the loss of my old way of life had been smoldering and burning away, like dross. This, I've found, is how God often works. Not in a blinding flash, but in a slow and subtle transformation that cannot be perceived by the naked eye. 
like watching a garden grow. Fear could be replaced with hope only when I was finally willing to see my life with all its petty ambitions as a seed. I could try to lock it up, worrying that it might get dirty or wet or worse, buried. But to fear those things is to forget what a seed is for. Fifteen years ago, God knew all about my self-centered cotton candy plans, and he saw fit to toss them in a puddle, let them dissolve, and give me something of real substance in their place. He took a look at my tidy blueprints for my life and lit them on fire. It all sounds so harsh, so heartless, but I think I can now safely say that there is no one I pity more than the one whose life goes exactly according to her own plans. In spite of my shallow desires, God gave me my firstborn son once as I teetered fearfully on the brink of life, and a second time, years later, as he was pulled back from the terrifying brink of death. And God has given my son his own story of being recalled to life again, life that is of more value than many sparrows. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was the opening section of Hannah Greaser's The Clouds You So Much Dread. If you'd like to hear the rest of the book on audio, you can purchase it at canonpress.com or anywhere audiobooks are sold.